So for the first time ever, I'm going to start with a trigger warning. In this episode with historian Thaddeus Russell, I get into some heavy topics, including slavery, lynchings, um, and, and a bunch of other things that are not typically dealt with in normal conversation, certainly not on this podcast. I also want to say that after re-listening to the episode, some of it sounds like we're talking a little flippantly about these topics, uh, and I don't push back on some things that many people would consider racist or, or something like that. And the reason is because I've known Thaddeus for a few years, and I've listened to hours and hours of his content, and I've talked to him for hours, and I know that he's not racist. So knowing his material, knowing his positions on these things, that he's more anti-racist than most people claim to be anti-racist, uh, I didn't push back on some things that might strike some people in the audience as a little weird. Um, realize when we're pushing back against some of the historic narratives uh, I'm not, none of us are saying slavery is good or that lynchings were uh, an acceptable form of criminal justice, right? Uh, we're just saying that when we talk about the actual reality of the situations, because when things are exaggerated, it's being done for some narrative purpose. You don't have to exaggerate how bad slavery was, right? It was terrible. But what it, what are these exaggerations of the historical record being put on us for? Like, what are the purposes? Uh, and it's for narrative control. So Knowing the truth, I think, is always worth it. So I know this is uh, a bit of a risky episode in the current cancel culture, but uh, I'm going to release it anyway. Uh, take that trigger warning and know that as a liberty-minded person, all people are individuals. Uh, historical evils don't need to be exaggerated for them to still be evil. All right, with that said, here's my episode with Thaddeus Russell. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Practical Liberty. My name is Henry Bingaman. Merry Christmas. First of all, I know it's Christmas weekend when this will be coming out. And uh, I may not have the son of God on, but I have the next best thing. Uh, my favorite historian, Thaddeus Russell, wrote the best history book I've ever read. If you're on my email list, I've talked about this nonstop. It is just a different perspective on American history, one that you don't get in school. And it's one that I think people kind of need to understand a little better that history wasn't done by the goody two shoes. So it's, uh, it's a much more deep dive, interesting take on American history and how we actually got to where we are instead of the great man theory. Anyway, Thaddeus, thank you so much for coming on. Henry, call me Thad. What are you doing? Dad. Thaddeus, I feel I need to be proper with you. You're like the, the history professor I always wanted and never had. We are friends, though, so I want to make that clear. But yeah, so not the son of God, not the historian of God. I mean, I've actually been called the historian of the Antichrist. I could um, much more believe that about you than, yeah, anything, anything godly. No offense. <laughs> I mean, there's actual people who have said that in public, that I represent the Antichrist. And they're not wrong in that the book, Renegade History, and a lot of my work, not all of it, but certainly renegade history is very much more than a critique, a criticism, you could even call it an attack on the Christian precepts of American civilization, for sure. In America, Christianity took its most important form as Puritanism, right? In early America, as we all know, right, the Puritans were the first Christians to show up and they persevered not just in holding onto the land, but in creating a true Puritan culture, city upon a hill, across New England and even even into Virginia, there was some puritanical thinking. And to this day, much of American formal culture is suffused with puritanical assumptions about the body and about sex and about leisure and about work and about gender roles and all the rest of it that we all know about. And we are still oddly, amazingly, in the Western world, completely considered to be the most puritanical of all the countries. Even in many Eastern countries, they look at us and think, why do you care that the president had a mistress? They don't get it. So my book is an extended critique of the puritanical history of America. And the way that I do that is not to just complain about it and say, ew, you are authoritarians and you told all the women to cover their bodies and you didn't let us drink alcohol for 10 years. No, it's looking at the history of the other Americans who have always been here too, all the way back to Plymouth Rock and since, which is people who were not Puritans. Or they were people who were, and this is most of us actually, partly puritanical. We have some ideas that are puritanical. And part of us are hedonists. And we sort of go to war all the time, every day. I think I'm speaking probably for most Americans right now. There's this battle inside of each of us every day. Do I get up when the alarm clock goes off and go to work? Or do I stay in bed? How long do I stay at work? Do I leave early? Do I stay late? Do I think that work in itself is a virtue and makes you a good person? Just doing work, no matter what the work's for, no matter whether you make any money for it, doing work makes an American feel good. And again, this is where Europeans look at us and they're like, what on earth? Work yeah. is a means to an end. That's it. They love their holidays and vacations. The average vacation time in Europe is six weeks per year. That's the norm. 
They get six weeks per year off entirely. Paid vacation. That is the norm in Europe. They think we're absolute crazy people about work. And then, of course, the sex part. That's very well known. The puritanical ideas about sex, which has always been at war with another thing that's really obvious in American culture, which is our hedonism. We're also sexual hedonists. I mean, it's, you know, it, porn consumption is off the charts in every state. I start to hesitate sometimes when I recommend the book because there is a lot of sex talk. I just laugh every time I picture George Washington just wading through a sea of prostitutes to get to the Capitol in Philadelphia back in the day, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And it was just it was a den of of bars and, and hookers back in the day. Really people, was. People... I have a, there's a map. I actually produced a map that didn't make it into the book uh, because just for stupid technical reasons. But I have a map of all of the brothels and so-called body houses and taverns in Philadelphia during the Re American Revolution in the seven, eight, 1770s and 80s. And it is so packed that you can't really see the street for all the pin marks <laughs> for all. I mean, it's central Phil Philadelphia was Sodom and Gomorrah, which is hilarious. Um, I lived there for a, a, over a decade. I, I had a, I owned a house just outside Italian Market. Like I know the city really well. So I'd actually love to see that map. I'll show it. To, yeah, yeah, totally. It's yeah, it's one of my favorite things. One of the things I was thinking, though, is why I recommend it anyway, is because there's no greater motivator in human history than sex, right? It permeates everything we do. The sex motivation, it has to have an influence on history. And so the fact that it's so ignored by the Puritans, you're necessarily necessarily ignoring how some history was formed by ignoring the sex drive. Such a huge point that like, I don't think I've been interviewed about this book probably a thousand times, literally, because it came out 13 years ago. I don't think anyone's ever brought that up, Henry. Yeah. So the psychologists of all kinds, not just the weird psychologists and the Freudians, I mean, basically all psychologists have been saying to us for about 200 years now, sex is what is most important in our mental and emotional lives. It is central always in our thinking and our doing, even if we project no evidence of any sexuality at all, which is most people in public put up this front that is asexual, right? And that's why it's sort of odd when you think about someone you know being sexual because they're so good. We are so good at repressing that. And we repress it almost all day, every single day. But from Freud onward, they've been telling us, the professionals in this have been saying sex and sexuality is central. It's constant. It's like it's on people's minds in various ways all the time. It causes us to make particular decisions in life that are central, that are historic in our lives, right? As to like who we choose as a mate or whether we choose people as a mate or what kinds of a mate, right? And it goes on and on and on. Our expectations about the children that we have, you know, whether they should be gay or straight and in what ways, you know, do we want a, our daughter to wear booty shorts when she turns 12? And it's it goes on and on and on and on. And you're right, though. When I got to graduate school in the history department at Columbia University in 1991. I went to the library and I sat, this is in the one of the leading research libraries in the world. It has, you know, it's famous for its history department, its collections. And I would just go, my job was as a history student to just read as much as I possibly could and get acquainted with all of the books in American history. And I just read book after book, after book, after book, after book, every single day for months and months and months. And by about like November, December, two or three months into my stint as a graduate student, I, I noticed that like there is not one mention of this thing that psychologists have been saying to us is central in human existence. No mention whatsoever of sex sexuality, even indirectly in history books, books about American history. History is ostensibly the study of everything that happened before right now. And if the most important thing in people's lives, in their lives, not make an appearance in any of the histories of this whole country, something's really missing. And so discovering that in the 1990s was a really fortunate thing, I guess, for me in terms of my career, because as I said, no, basically no one, there were like two or three, I mean, literally that many people in American history, the profession who were even thinking about sex and sexuality at that time. So once I started to look at the narrative, the history, the evidence, just look at from the pilgrims to the present, the whole thing through the lens of sexuality, it's like looking at a seen through one of those black light things, you know, all of a sudden you see all the blood. So where do you get the source material for this stuff? Like you you have a bunch of chapters that are around it that you, I mean, you had to get source material somewhere. Like you said, you read all those books. It was never mentioned. Where do you even start looking for this stuff? Yeah. So that was the most challenging and most fun and most satisfying part of it. Maybe it forces one, if you're interested in those questions and you're looking at something like U U.S. history, it forces you to look outside of traditional sources because they don't have anything in there. So how does one do that? Well, <laughs> there's a few ways that I've done it and others have since me have done it. One is 
thankfully in the United States, we're such a young country. We've basically always had newspapers, even in colonial America, there were essentially newspapers and, you know, newspapers, you know, in say 1770 or 1830 in the United States, we're not concerned about political correctness and, and saying, <laughs> saying polite things about criminals and criminals of a certain and color, et cetera. In other words, they were extremely frank about what was going on in the streets. And so their reports of crime, you know, they reported the crime as it happened with no apologies, right? Breitbart, even though it is racist and grotesque in many ways, were making a really good point by establishing on their news website an entire vertical called Black Crime. Because the media reports on crime in ways that are just so obfuscating, you know, right. that we don't really know what's going on from looking... So anyway, back in the day before the 1960s, you know, there wasn't the media didn't really care about this stuff. So crime reports, you get a lot of sense of what's going on. You get all the reports of the being arrested. You get reports of race riots. You get reports of attacks on police. I did a study of violence in Birmingham, Alabama, just before in the decade before the civil rights in the 1950s. So high segregation, Jim Crow, what's going on in Birmingham is sort of like the most famous racist police force, Bull Connors, the police mm. chief, right? And everything everyone knew about that still to this day, really, unless they've read my work, is that, oh, that's when the black people got bitten by dogs and beaten and, and fire hosed on the streets of Birmingham. But no, it turned out that for years and years and years and years, ordinary black people were kicking the living shit out of Birmingham cops on a damn near daily basis. So yeah, I spent some time in the police department records in Birmingham, Alabama. Amazingly, yeah, they're, they're, I think they're called the Bull Connor Papers, in fact, and they're all there. And they, for some reason, they kept all the resisting arrest records, all the arrest records. So I'm just in there resisting arrest records in Birmingham, Alabama. It's just one thing after another. Black women biting police officers, black women holding a shotgun and shooting it over the head of Klan's members who were threatening her husband. On Just, just all sorts of beatings, shootings, stabbings of cops, of cops in Birmingham all up to that time. So there's this whole, what we call in the profession, hidden transcript. That's James Scott's locution. He's one of the very few historians who kind of did what I do before me, but he looked at Southeast Asia, but he called it the hidden transcript, the stuff that doesn't show up in the sources that most historians look at. But the thing is, historians could find it if they wanted to, they're not interested in it. Right. And that's, that's the real problem here, Henry, that you're really pointing to is that the historical profession, like all academic professions, was created, was invented, created, formed, established in the 19th century, the late 19th century, which is called the progressive era, but it was also the high Victorian era when what we call bourgeois values were dominant. So Victorianism, so this is high Puritanism. So the professions were created by Victorians. The professors at the time were upper class people who were Victorians, Puritans, who believed that sex, what, what did Vic Queen Victoria think about sex talk? <laughs> <laughs> it should not happen, right? It's been called the Great Repression, the Victorian era. And the, the main form of it was that we simply stopped talking about sex and we stopped showing it, we stopped doing it also. Prior to the Victorian era, it was very common for families to sleep all in the same bed and for, yes, to have lots of incestuous sex. That became taboo during the Victorian era. So we stopped thinking about it, talking about it and doing it in public and doing it. Public sex was also completely common. If you've read my book, you'll see that that's what you're kind of referring to in Philadelphia. And so the historical profession, the academic profession, universe, the modern universities, the culture of the universities of today were created in America during that time. And so the expectation was as a professor at one of these universities, yeah, you're not going to write about what people are doing in their bedrooms. That's we don't talk about that. This is a respectable culture. It's What's interesting, I just taught I just taught the Quran at the Unregistered Academy. Yeah. And I love teaching the Quran. And one of the reasons I love it is that it is full of sensuality and sexuality and basically a celebration of it, but certainly no attempt to repress it. And there's like tremendous detailed descriptions of sensuality and sexuality both on earth and in heaven. And it's a really marked contrast with the Christian West. You know, you see this. It's just there is the default baseline is repression in the West. You don't think uh, in some Muslim cultures where they 
have the full burqa get up. There's no repression there. I haven't read the Quran. I don't pretend to be any expert in it. But just from an outside observer looking at it, it would say that's more sexually repressed than the West where people are walking around watching on their phone in the bus station. It, it yeah. gets weird sometimes. The Sharia law is mo almost entirely a product of what's called the Hadith, the post-Quran interpretations of the Quran by Muslim clergy. Okay. So that that's what the, that's where Muslim law comes from. It comes from their interpretation. Just like in just like in Judaism, and one could say even in Christianity, right? It's the it's the priests or the rabbis after the text who who interpret and say, oh, this is what the law should be based on what our book says, right? So you you find you'll find some repression for sure in the Quran sexually, and I'd say in particular around women, but there's also I mean it's it's but it's muted. It's a it's sort of um it's not central at all. It's like sort of this reminder, this stern reminder. Well, one shouldn't drink much, you know. But then they'll go on and on about all the virgins one's gonna have, you know, right. in heaven and all the wine that will be drunk in heaven and and often even in, in um on earth they'll talk about you know specific detailed sensual pleasures anyway so it just there is something in the west that you don't find and, and i would say also the repression in the middle east and in muslim world is just a different form it is repression for sure obviously but it's a different form and it's much more complex than people understand there's there's actually more to it than people understand what we have in the west is this thing that we know about which is that we have been told since the bible that sex itself sexuality itself thoughts about sex the act any act of sex is at bottom something to be ashamed of problematic dangerous to be hidden that's the default there is no sexual act or sexual thought that we just present to the public the way we would present our sunglasses like we don't we walk outside with sunglasses on we don't think anyone's going to care about it no like sexual thoughts do you hide that right and you keep it <laughs> and so that's that's the west and that's what we've had but the good news is for those who aren't Puritans, as I said, in this country for sure, but I, I'm arguing actually in all other countries that I've studied, but in this country for sure, you've had not just, res I mean, you've had both resistance to Puritan repression, but also, good Lord, the most extravagant displays of hedonism in world history. I mean, we, we topped Rome in like our displays of getting it on and pleasure, right? I mean, Las Vegas itself, just Las Vegas alone is, you know, the world champion of that kind of thing. So this is the weird American psyche that is so fascinating. And this is one of the reasons I love studying this country that I live in is that we have maybe the most schizophrenic culture in the world. We have yeah. this deep, profound, vicious, often puritanical heritage and culture at the very same time and coexisting right next door to Sin City everywhere. And so that's the question or that's the way I started to look at American history is through that lens, through that ongoing constant battle between these two forces, Puritanism and hedonism in American culture. It always seems to me the Puritans are always outnumbered, right? It seems like they are the smaller group throughout history, but they control the narrative in so many different ways. If there were a true democratic process, it doesn't seem like it would have gone that way if people were allowed to think for themselves. But I guess there's also the, like you pointed out, there's the conflict because we both have the Puritan and the hedonist inside both. Uh, so it's like, which way do you go? <laughs> we we love the hedonism. We're not giving it up. But when you go to the voting booth or whatever, do you vote the Puritan? How does that narrative get set and controlled? Yeah. And one of the other things that's really interesting. So you you talk a lot about like the black experience in slavery in, in the book, which is one of the more interesting parts of it. And I was fascinated because I'd never heard this before reading the book a couple of years ago, a few years ago, mm -hmm. that there mm -hmm. were slaves that were like, not that happy that slavery was over. They didn't have to work that hard on their their farms. They, you know, got weekends off. They had three, you know, three meals a day and which, of course, doesn't say anything about black people in particular. Just the human condition is like, dude, if you're going to take care of me, maybe I don't want it to end no matter what freedoms I have to give up. <laughs> yeah. Roughly half of all American slaves chose, voluntarily chose. In fact, they were encouraged to leave the plantation when the Union troops showed up. The half of them chose to stay on their plantations working for their original owners. I think it's it's close to a majority of slaves who were interviewed after the Civil War said, I mean, spoke glowingly of their masters, had a positive view of their masters. And some of them had a had a very affectionate view of their masters and saw them basically as parent figures to them. And and many, many owners felt likewise. They felt a paternal duty and obligation and affection for their slaves. Paternalistic, obviously, in the most extreme paternal. This is paternalism in its most extreme form, no doubt about it. And my sensibilities as a 21st century American, whatever, and I'm sure the sensibilities of most Americans and people in the West look at that and just recoil. They just hear this. They just hear, oh, wait, slavery. Ugh, and they stop thinking about it. Now, this is in no way some argument trying to convince people to 
to to bring back slavery. But what it is, and what the book, what those chapters, the two chapters in which I deal with this in the book are doing is to to stop and think about what's really going on here and why black culture ultimately became what it became. And that was really the question I had coming into the book. Why is it that people who were enslaved, the people who were slaves in our society are the ones who invented jazz, the music of freedom, who invented all these artistic and cultural forms that are at their heart expressions of freedom, liberation, dancing and singing, and even in athletics and sports, right? I mean, the, the black athlete changed all the games by introducing individual freedom to the way you play them. What the hell? How did the enslaved people bring freedom to this country? In American culture, all this stuff that I think is comes from freedom comes from blacks or gays, in some cases, Jews, but especially blacks. All this stuff that's the most fun in American culture comes from black people, you know? <laughs> and it's because of the freedom of it, because they weren't just dancing the waltz in a square over and over again. They weren't playing classical European music, which had no improvisation in it. Black music, jazz, the blues, all of it has had improvisation at the heart of it. I mean, that there's nothing, no greater expression of individual freedom than a jazz solo. I'm always fascinated. I don't know if it's because I'm white or not, but there's something I don't get in music. I was in a car with Raekwon from Wu-Tang Clan one time, and he's DJing this whole ride. He's just in the passenger seat playing the song, <laughs> but I forget whose song it was, but he keeps replaying. He's like, he hears something in the music and he goes back 15 seconds and re-listens and he re-listens and he re he played this part five times in a row. And he's like, ah, I see what he's doing there. So he came here and did that. I, I didn't hear anything different from the rest of the song, but he heard the, the tiniest little nuance. Now, obviously he's a professional musician. He's going to hear some things that people don't, but there is something that I don't know the way I was raised is like evangelical white boy. Even though I was in the inner city, it's like, I just don't, I don't have that culture. I don't hear those things. I don't feel those things the same way that some people there, can. There is what I have called and some historians have called black working class culture. We, that's just the category we use. It's the closest we can get to being precise. So yeah, why is, why is black working class culture been the culture of freedom? And by the way, oh, the other part of the freedom of that culture is criminality. I mean, we've got to talk about this and everyone should be, I mean, but it's obvious. So yes, there's a lot of good times to be had. And this is what liberals who love black people so much we'll talk about all the time. We'll talk about Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin, on and on and on. And that's all true. And that's what I love too. And this is why I love black culture so, so much. But what they will not talk about is that every goddamn rap song today talks about stealing and beating and sometimes women. That's not occasionally voiced on rap songs. That is standard lyrics in rap songs in the top Top 40, hip hop, hit list, billboard list, criminality has been central in black music going all the way back to the blues. And there's been some great work on this done by Mary Beth Hamilton, a historian. Yeah, there's criminal behavior that's part of this free culture too. So again, so why this free culture? Why this free culture among people who were enslaved? Well, again, it's because they were enslaved. And I think you were sort of pointing to this earlier when you were describing the argument, but they were the most expensive and valuable possessions to slave owners. People are so ridiculous when they they talk about the plantation like it's Django Unchained, like it was just a torture factory. So the idea that this is truly, this is actually the idea that most American liberals and leftists even have, and maybe even a lot of conservatives have about what slavery was. White people rounded up all the black people and whipped them to death for about a hundred years and other women whenever they could. So every day the master would get up and go all the women and then whip the, the men and then go back to sleep. And it wasn't and that there was none of that going on, but it was just way more rare than people like to pretend. Mm -hmm. And if you go the, the Puritan route, they were beating the shit out of their kids up north. Like their children were treated worse than the slaves on a lot of plantations. Now, obviously not universal, but like if you want a real sense of what's going on on the ground, it was a lot of violence in the north and the northeast, especially right. Like the Puritan cultures, they're just horrible to children. So go read any biography of any of the most famous, wealthy, powerful Americans of the 19th century, any one of them, including the Quakers. The Quakers, what they did to their school children to discipline them was not to hit them, but to hang them in sacks from the ceiling in the middle of the room, burlap sacks. They put the kid in the burlap sack and just hang him there for the whole day to punish him. Read the biography of any great American of the 19th century. They will tell you about getting their fucking asses whipped on the daily often, but definitely always regularly. And I'm talking about with sticks, with leather belts, with branches, with whole like limbs of trees, with planks, with metal rods. Oh yeah, I'm talking about read the biographies of John Rockefeller, Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Carnegie, Ulysses S. Grant, Thomas Edison, name an American, a great American. And I'm talking, 
the wealthiest too. And they got their asses kicked by adults when they were kids, <laughs> when they were apprentices, which was a big thing back in early America, apprenticeships for the crafts. Yeah, it was absolutely standard to like knock the crap out of your apprentice as a math master. The kid who's like a 17 year old is like learning the trade with you. Hey, you, you did that wrong. Pap! Hit him in the back of the head. So many stories about this. This is not invented. And this is white people in the North, in the North. Now in the South and in, in the plantations and slavery, there was whipping. And in fact, we have records. One very large plantation in Mississippi, the Barrow plantation kept its records of all its whippings i think for two years period we have all the record we have we know every single how many whippings exactly on a big plantation quite representative in the mississippi in the 18 i think 40s so per slave it was a little more than one whipping per year now to you and me and everyone listening to this and every modern ear in right. the west what the fuck you got whipped once a year? Are you fucking kidding? Yes, it's an absolute horror. It's like unspeakably horrific. In the context of 19th century America, there is no doubt in my mind, and I've showed the evidence to show there's lots and lots of evidence, quantitative and qualitative evidence, slaves were beaten less children in 19th century America. Yes, no doubt about it. Same with... So... It's actually, it's horrific to think about now, but in the, in the 19th century and even like well into the 20th century it was basically unenforced. I mean, the law against it. It was rare in the 19th, very rare for a to go to prison. Just, they just didn't care about women at all. Like it was just, first of, and that well, was, you're yes, talking about. Well, so first of all, you had, you had a very weak state apparatus. John Brown, people don't realize this, you know, John Brown, what he did was before Harper's Ferry, he traveled on horseback with his sons and a bunch of dudes on horseback all the way from New York to Kansas and back people, slaughtering people all, all the way there and all the way back and like never saw law enforcement. I mean, what? <laughs> he was cutting off people's heads and dismembering them in Kansas and just got on his horse and just took like whatever two weeks to get back to New York State and went back to his farm and plotted Harper's Ferry and started the Civil War. Yeah, but there was no, because there was no, hardly any cops. The state was tiny. Law enforcement in the 19th century was not. The professionalization of police starts with the progressives in the city and the cities in the late 19th right. century, like the 1880s, 90s, they get serious. But especially in the West, anywhere like west of the Appalachians, like well, there's no cops. Basically. This is this is why lynch mobs were a thing. Now, obviously there was misuse, but you had to have the, the lynch mob to go after the person. If somebody got it's better to lynch them than just let them get away with it. Like that's what happened back in the day. That's there wasn't a police um, apparatus that would just throw you in jail and you could have your court trial. But so I've actually gone through hundreds of the lynching cases during the heyday of lynching in the late 19th century. And when you actually study them, if you look at the news reports and, and multiple eyewitness accounts and what was going on, it's very clear that the vast majority of them woman. Yeah. I mean, it, now, it, is this an endorsement of lynching? No, no, sir. It is totally not. I am not at all. In, in fact, I'm completely opposed to it. But that was not so much because of racism. And also, by the way, one third of the people who were lynched during that period were white. Right. That's why I was, that's and, why I was saying it's lynching was just a, a form of enforcing, you know, norms and laws. And those guys overwhelmingly, I'm sure there were some innocents. I'm positive there were mm -hmm. innocents, but overwhelmingly, I'm positive. I'm sure they were like bad, terrible. Right. It's really hard to feel bad for a that gets lynched an actual yeah then there's just good old this is before feminism this is before this is you know good it's a good old patriarchal society in which but although also you know that it was impossible it was legally impossible for a husband to his wife until the 1960s in most states you could do whatever you wanted to your wife and you were not going to prison short of killing her even beating her you'd have to beat her really really badly and you'd have to do it repeatedly to go to prison but here no man was convicted of his wife in america there was almost no enforcement of law and and there was no law in marriage, which is where most of the happens. And so for American women was common. It was just common. Now I'm talking about among American women who were not slaves. So on the plantation, how common was now we don't have statistics, of course, for any of this. And evidence, of course, is extremely hard to come by, but we have lots and lots and lots of anecdotal evidence and other forms of evidence. Some of it's actually is quantitative to show that was way less common between owner and slave than we are led to believe by people like Quentin Tarantino. The best quantitative evidence we have is of the populations, the sort of so-called racial composition of the populations of the deep South, where most slavery was and where it lasted longest, and then the, the upper South. And what you'll find is that in the deep South, it's overwhelmingly 
it's like more than 90% of the slaves as of the civil war were not, were not mulatto, were considered to be 100% African. Almost all of the so-called mulattoes, people of mixed race, lived in the upper South, lived outside of the the real plantation South. So these were people who were living among whites. These were people who were living in cities. These were black people who were free. These were people who could commingle with whites and have sex with them easily. Black people in the South on plantations, the only most the only whites they really came into contact with were the the owners and the foreman, et cetera. But they produced hardly any mulatto offspring. So it's we, one of the misseg the so-called miscegenation, interracial sex, clearly mostly happened not outside of slavery outside of slavery. One of the things that's always fascinated me um, is you know, I grew up in the inner city. I never really saw racism until I started going to college and then I'd see it there. It always <laughs> seems to be the more elite people are the the most, they actually look down on black people more than like the people in the factory that I worked in the summer job is like, there were race jokes going on. There were black people, white people like just ribbing each other. And there was no racism until you get to the higher ends in the elites. It doesn't surprise me that like a plantation owner who would be one of the elites of the day would look, look at a black person differently than somebody in the you know brothels up north that would be happy to go you know hang out with with a, a black man or woman for the night yeah what i tell people instead of like reading the history of slavery go to a, go to the deep south go to mississippi louisiana alabama georgia south carolina go to any one of those states go to a city or any i don't care go to any place in any one of those states go to the first restaurant you see walk inside and look at the tables and i can pretty much guarantee you you know if it's at least half full that there will you will see multiple mixed race tables. You will see also within an hour of being in any southern city, you'll see multiple mixed race couples too. Um, we have statistics on this. There's more. There's much more uh, mixed race marriage in the South than in the North and the West. But you'll just see it. Just go and you'll look. You'll see like interracial couples are normal in the South. They're weird. They're still weird in the North. People still comment on it. Ooh, even if you're like cool and groovy and liberal and live in like New York or something, and you see like a mixed race, you'll still like. Make some little joke about it. Um, in the South, it's just like it's what people do. Uh, you'll also see a whole a whole population of like young white boys, especially. I think it's girls too. Yeah, it's both boy, young white working class people in the South quite often adopt black culture and adopt the whole thing. I mean, Paul Wall, the the great rapper from Houston, he's a great example of that. I watched about three or four videos of him before I realized he was white, and he's <laughs> he's lighter than I am. I mean, he's real white but he's so he's so fully immersed in the black affect and culture that it's you really can't tell <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and he's white. So, and that's very common in the South. He's from Houston. So yeah, man, it's, um, it's all upside down the way people think about race in this country still. It's just upside down. It's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't get a lot of it. <laughs> it's never, I, it literally I in whatever it was, 2001, I was in high school and I said to my, one of my teachers that like, yeah, racism, a thing that doesn't exist anymore because like that was a thing of the past. And she laughed at me cause I was just a, whatever, 16, 17 year old. And then I, but I really believed it at the time when you live around people that are, are just, you know, my high school was 20% black, 40% Hispanic, 40% white. Like it's, you just, you don't, you That's don't. like my high school. Yeah. That's just like my high school. Yeah. Berkeley high is just like that. Yeah. We're super integrated. It just don't. It, and you know, my best friend was Puerto Rican. It, it's just how it was growing up. There's a, so one topic, I don't know why this just came to my mind. It was, I can't stop laughing that all the Christian conservatives sharing gay on Twitter this week. <laughs> Have you seen that? The, oh, the video with a yeah. congressional staffer? What, yeah. what is up with that? Like what? That seems so hypocritical. Like they're literally sharing. It's censored, but it's why are they so obsessed with this story? Uh, so for <laughs> this will be a week in the future that this comes out. So we, we just found out the sub, whatever the media site was leaked the congressional staffer having gay sex in one of the in Congress. But conservatives are obsessed with this. And to me, it's just like, dude, film the sex tape. It's like it's not cool, I guess. I I'd be mad if that was my seat in Congress. But <laughs> other than that, I'm like, Dude, it's Do a we know whose seat it is? I don't know. You could probably figure it out. I'm not even sure. Are they assigned? I'm not even sure they're assigned seats. I, I don't know. I used, to work, I used to work in that building. Really? In, 19, in 1988, I was uh, an intern for the Associated Press in their Capitol Hill office. And yeah, I worked inside that building right there in the building. And I, we looked, we had in our offices, there was a window that overlooked the Senate and the House floors. So I just sit up there and watch these senators give speeches in 1988. So, all right. Yeah. Let's talk about the right wing in yeah. this country. Yeah. The recent contemporary right wing and maybe my relationship with it <laughs> because i'd like people to hear this and i think this will probably confound and confuse people who don't know me from i mean i've always been a fan of large parts of trump and maga large parts i mean a fan 
like what he said about foreign policy in particular, I didn't love everything he did in foreign policy, right. but a lot and not, not everything he said either. But I would say most more than half of what Trump has said about foreign policy, I heartily endorse and welcome and actually makes me pretty excited. And I've said this since the first campaign when he was giving speeches during the campaign in 2015, like in places like South Carolina, giving speeches against these never ending wars and against yeah. NATO and like to a South Carolina, like Republican audience. Incredible. I, you know, I loved him calling out the hypocrisy and corruption of the media and of the political class. And he did that relentlessly. And that's one of the reasons they hated him so much. I loved his hedonism. This is the another major reason, not the not the why the elite hates him, but why the Democrat rank and file, the average voter, especially women hate him so much is because he's not puritanical because he flouts all those puritanical norms, right? And he celebrates his money and he celebrates the excess and he celebrates his hot wife and all the things you're not supposed to do. That's why they go crazy about him. So I was not, certainly didn't vote for him, certainly didn't like endorse him or the movement, but I saw some very, very good and important things in it that I thought were endorsing on their own. And that was my position. And I was sort of generally just very interested in MAGA and this nationalist populist movement, both here and abroad. And I was really curious about where it was going to go. All the while, I noticed that they kept talking about Judeo-Christian values, Judeo-Christian values, and, you know, had things like prayer on their shows and stuff. And so long as it stays there, I'm still cool with it. So I was watching Steve Bannon's War Room every single day for a couple of years, actually, and kind of becoming a fan of a lot of people. In fact, I had several people from MAGA, from his show on my show, who I really like to this day. But then my good friend, James Lindsay, and, you know, I do consider him still a friend. And he was on my show several times. We taught a course together. Whenever that, that was, I don't know, somewhere around 2020, 21, he, he and Libs of TikTok, my not friend, Haya Rat Ratchik. Yeah. Started basically this groomer hysteria campaign and the entire right wing fell for it. The whole right wing, everybody outside of like moderate Republican circles, like most libertarians I knew were fell for this shit. The entire MAGA base, this became their cause for about a year. There was that whole movie Sound of Freedom. People forget about Sound of Freedom, thank God. But that was like the cause for quite a while, lots of libertarians, unfortunately, were into this, still are. Um, well, the, the premise is horrifying that a, a bunch of like, if you buy the premise that a bunch of children are being groomed for sexual course. slavery, essentially, it's of course, yeah, of, uh, or, any, any... or they're being or worse, like they're being groomed to alter their bodies permanently and then ha and then be, you know, part of some LGB, some queer sex ring or something. Right. That's that's exactly the fantasy. I mean, that's exactly what they think. There is more of that than there used to like I, I know people that have, quote unquote, trans kids and it's oh yeah I, I never had heard of that until i got oh. out of oh no i'm 100 percent with the right wing on surgery and puberty blockers of course no one should before 18 needs to do that like that's no of course no but it's 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 all the fantasies that spins out of that okay. right and first of all the number of kids still even today who do those things is still tiny but whatever it's I agree with them completely. But no, they spin these fantasies about the motivations of not just the doctors who do it and the activists who push for it, but then it now becomes about the Democratic Party and liberals generally are all pro pro want to mutilate and have sex with your kids. Like, it's also kind of strange. Wait, why would they want to mutilate them, then have sex with them? That's just Hillary um, Clinton. And then this idea that that there's a this global cabal of satanic pedophiles. I mean, I took a poll on my Twitter about this. And I asked my followers whether they believe that, that there's a global cabal of satanic pedophiles running the governments of the world. And like, I forget the number, but it was a healthy percentage said yes. And I just see it. I see it sort of an offhand comments among quite prominent people in kind of our world, like the, the dissident world. I mean, I mean, even someone like Joe Rogan, I think gives it a little bit of credence and, you know, I, and I'm sorry, I just still haven't seen any evidence to suggest that. I guess what it's it, like, what, and what, what, sorry, just the last thing to say is like, why do we need to invent that? We have plenty of reasons to hate them. <laughs> and all you're doing is like splitting apart this coalition by making up these crazy claims about, I mean, you know, hello, the global liberal elite, like, yo, sign me up. Give me a gun. I'm with you. Let's go fight them. But making up these bizarre ideas, these claims that also end up negatively, very negatively affecting lots and lots of people for no good reason, including me. I mean, how many people got caught up in that QAnon thing and got accused of something over the last couple of years who were like, just doing nothing it's it, ridiculous it's one of the the things is it's really most people have been asleep their whole life to what's going on in, in the world order essentially and so once you start actually seeing what some of these global elites are capable of it, it's hard to put anything past them you're like oh they'll just go 
tens of thousands or millions of people in Yemen and Gaza, and they don't care at human lives at all. How low can they go? It's the conspiracy theories are not hard to spin when you just realize that these are psychopaths who hate humanity. They literally just don't like humans and they're willing to kill all of them. Maybe why wouldn't they babies? It's one of those things that's like you it's wake up to it. In the middle you of your life, is? it's like it's very similar to Israel on October 7th. It's like what Israel is saying about October 7th. It's like, wait, why do you keep needing to invent beheaded babies and gang? women like civilians were shot in the face i saw it that's you know one civilian getting shot in the face is isn't that enough why do you need to invent these things hillary clinton has not she done plenty on camera right. <laughs> i mean like more than enough and also come on it's been decades since the clintons right this stuff started with the clintons by the way this obsession with democrat democratic sexual um perversion started with bill and the Republican obsession with him and, and Monica Lewinsky. So they've had 30 plus years and we still have seen really basically zero evidence of a global satanic ring. I think we would have seen something by now. I mean, the only thing I've ever seen that looks anything like it is, is Alex Jones at the Bohemian Grove, but it's not even clear what's really going on there. So who knows? I mean, again, though, the main point is, hey, hello, they did Iraq. <laughs> They did Libya. They yeah. did the prison industrial complex. They did cops with tanks in the cities. That's them. That's the Democrat. That's the global cabal. Isn't that enough? Yeah. I mean, they're doing Gaza now. They're killing little children by the minute right now. Isn't that enough? So let's talk about Gaza because that's a, a topic that yeah, I know everybody's please. thinking about. And it's I so it's very awkward for me to talk about because I have a lot of friends who are good friends who are just they're Zionists. They're just they they're Jewish. They believe that Israel is like God's gift to the Jewish people. And then the, the Israeli government from there, I don't know how they get this logically, but then the Israeli government can do no wrong. They're just trying to protect their people. But I look at it and they just assassinated three of their own hostages that were shirtless, waving white flags and they killed them in Gaza. The people that were kidnapped, like the actual victims of October 7th. What are they doing? Like, what is going on in Gaza? This doesn't make any sense to me the way the way I'm looking at it. Man. Yeah, I um I've cried pretty much every day since it started because I I think I think for just about anybody who has studied this conflict for a while and knows it fairly well, I think it's hard not to. I mean, there were reasons to cry about Palestine way before October seventh, and on October seventh, we all knew exactly what was about to be done to the people of Gaza. So it's just we've been gripping our seats, just cringing, waiting for the bombs to drop, and then they started dropping, and then and then it became very clear that they weren't going to stop until the United States stops them. And that's that's why it's been hard to sleep for a lot of people and I've been an anti-war activist my literally my entire life. I mean I start I was in I was in marches as a child against the Vietnam War. And I have a lot of feelings about it. I've never had the feelings I do about this. Um the special circumstances of it. It is children, it's a million children trapped, captured, being bombed 24/7 by a government that has made it clear it will not stop. Well, and the other thing people don't so, realize that the bombing is not it's not that you get bombed and blown up. It's you get bombed and trapped under rubble and you dehydrate to death over the course of five days. This is not like some quick death that these children are getting. It is right, right horrific, now. horrific in ways you can't imagine. Right now, there are dozens, if not hundreds of children alive under rubble right now. Every minute of every day since October 7th, there have been many, many people at all times of every day under rubble. We don't even know how many bodies are under there yet. When they finally do all the excavation after the war ends, if it ever ends, we will then know. But we've seen the pictures, we've seen the videos, we know what it looks like. They've leveled all of northern Gaza and northern Gaza had more than a million people in it when they were doing that. And they're now saying they've 5,000 Hamas fighters. I will give you $1,000 if that's true. I would be surprised. Just a week ago, I heard the IDF guy on a Twitter space say that they had killed 1,000. And then they suddenly like jumped that figure up real fast. They were saying 1,000 for about a week or two. And then all of a sudden it was 5,000 out of 18 total killed, 18,000 killed. There's no chance. I have seen basically almost no video or photographic evidence of any military age male come out of there. And everybody's got cell phones. It's not like Hamas can control all that communication. They control some communication, of course. They can't control all the cell phone images that come out of there. And I just haven't seen military age males. Hamas is in the tunnels. We know this. This is why we know it's a genocidal war, because we know they can't kill Hamas by doing this. They can only kill civilians. I don't I've never seen Israel doesn't present the evidence for when they, why, you know, they bomb those buildings because there's a gun cache or there's a bomb somewhere in there. And you know, they'll take out 100 civilians. But the other thing is, like, even if it's all military age men, there are about 500,000 men in Gaza, the 40,000 people in Hamas. Like they're just I think they're counting everyone that's in a potential age range to be a Hamas fighter as Hamas. Like that's the only explanation for it. Of course. Yeah, I 
haven't seen a headband, you know, with a green headband. I haven't yeah. seen a head. I haven't seen uniform. I haven't seen a weapon pulled from a guy's hand. Like I haven't seen anybody who looks any remotely like a fighter dead in the rubble coming out, you know, going to the hospital. Nothing. It's almost all kids and women and portly old shopkeepers yeah, like the guys sense. they rounded up. Yeah. Those those images of the, the, the fat bakers like holding machine guns over their head like wait. with gray hair. Yeah, with those gray are, fucking hair. They just look terrified. They're not Hamas. Hamas would first of all, Hamas wouldn't surrender. Those guys are suicidal. They would shoot you till you got they got killed. They're happy to die for their cause. So until October seventh, I was I was what I would call a non-Zionist, and I'm part Jewish, and I've been around Jews my whole life. My ex-wife is Jewish, and my son therefore is Jewish and my mother is Jewish and I lived in New York City and LA for 30 years and I mean I've just and I was in Jewish I was an in-law in two Jewish families for 20 years and so until October 7th I was basically what I would call a non-Zionist like I wasn't like the BDS the boycott divest sanction movement came and went when I was still teaching and I thought this is not not me I'm not into it I don't need to force those people choose one way or the other what I was very clear on and I've always been very clear on I don't want to give a dollar to the project of Zionism in Israel. No, thank you. I don't want the United States, my country that represents me, helping them in any way whatsoever. But if they want to, if they want to try to maintain an exclusive Jewish ethno state in an ocean of Arab Muslims, good luck. I don't recommend it. And as I've always said, I'm really glad my grandfather, Noah Koenigsberg, emigrated from Pogrom, Ukraine to Chicago, not Haifa in the 1890s. I'm really glad he made that move because no Arab has killed any of us. We've been good in the US. The US is the Zion for Jews, goddammit. This is where we have by far been the safest. This is where by far Jews have been the most successful, most powerful, most celebrated, and most protected. It's not a thing. There was that one shooting at the synagogue a few years ago by a psychotic. True. That's about it. Leo Frank, the, the famous Jew who was lynched in 1913 by the Ku Klux Klan, by the early Klan. He was a Read the report. There's been multiple investigations into that. The famous Leo Frank case. Yeah, about how anti how anti-Semitic America is. No, he was a um, and he was the only one anyway that was lynched. No, this is this is Zion. In Israel and Palestine, since they established the fucking state, about 15,000 Jews have been killed because of the state of it in Israel, in the wars, in the terrorist attacks, in the you know, because of their resistance, because Palestinians refuse to allow their land to be taken. It's That's... not my thing. Like, I'm a cosmopolitan. I'd be like, fuck, I'm out of here. You know, let's go somewhere else. But it's also understandable why people want to keep their home, their ancestral home, their family's home, their, you know, the land that their families live on for 2000 years in most cases. And right. I get it. And they've simply refused to give up, even though the British Empire, the French Empire and the American Empire have all teamed up with Israelis and Zionists to destroy them. They still have not given up 70 hundred years later, it began in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration and the UK saying, this will be a Jewish homeland. We don't care about the Arabs. And then doing everything they could since then, well, along with the Americans and the French to help them. The funny thing about the Balfour Declaration is it didn't even say that. It said the Jews have a right to live there. It didn't say that they were they were not intentionally establishing a Jewish state. That is not at all what that meant. And the, <laughs> the Zionists just decided like, oh, we have a document. We're going to say, we're going to read it the way we want to read it. Uh, and we're saying that Britain gives us permission to create our state here. And we're just going to start well, pushing these Palestinians out. There was, I mean, no, there was a lot of um, interest in Britain to establish what they call the colonial beachhead in the Middle East. In fact, one a major British politician at the time said, "We it will be a, it'll be like a little Ulster on the Mediterranean, a little Ulster in the, among the Arabs, meaning a colony like I, in Ireland, Ulster in Ireland, um, British colony from which to conduct operations and to control the oil and to control that part of the world." And the Americans later said, Alexander Haig under Reagan said, "It, it is our." It is our unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Middle East. And that's what it's always been. So Israel has always been primarily the tip of the spear of the Anglo-American empire. And the Zionism was just a convenient thing for the Anglo-Americans. Oh, you Jews want to want to be our friends and run this country in the middle of the Middle East and help us out with the Arabs. Cool. And that's been the deal since 1917. But they're not even our friends um, all the time. Like if you look at like uh, Scott Horton did this whole a couple episodes on the USS Liberty in the 67, they literally will kill us if we get in their way. Like they're not the best friends we have in the world. So it's really interesting. Jewish culture. I've been thinking a lot about this and I've had Jewish anti-Zionists on my show and they're and I recommend them to everybody. Uh, read, Seek them out first. So people like Max Blumenthal, um, I had this brilliant rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro on my show, who's a, an anti-Zionist Orthodox Jew, Dan Cullen. I'm going to have some more on this week. So 
one of the things, and I, I'm sort of like consider myself like a part Jewish anti-Zionist, I guess now. Um, I was a non-Zionist before I am an anti-Zionist now is what I meant to say. That's what October okay. 7th, that's what the Gaza war has done to me. Because now it is clearly an emergency, not just for the people of Gaza, but it's now taking us very close to World War III. We are, we're at war with Iran. I mean, it's just an undeclared war. We're shooting back and forth right now with Iran. They are shooting at our military bases in Iraq and Syria, and we're shooting back. It's a war. We have aircraft carriers in the Red Sea, which are clearly just big targets because what's an aircraft carrier going to do against Hamas? Exactly. Yeah. But it's just all they did was move a giant target, right? A giant yeah. tripwire target into the middle of the Middle East, the Red Sea, where everybody's got weapons pointed at, you know, Iran can fire its missiles easily to the Red Sea and hit those aircraft carriers. And when that happens, then what, everybody? When Iran hits one of a, one of the, and by the way, every aircraft carrier has a, what's called a carrier strike group with it, which means five to seven battleships with it, yeah. giant fucking military ships all around in striking distance of Iran now. So if any one of our ships gets hit by an Iranian missile, or, and then there's also these proxies, Iran has all these, or not even proxies, they're allies. They're basically, I don't know, they're resistance groups that are all around Iraq and Syria, all around the Middle East that either have a relationship with Iran or don't, but they have their own little missile systems and they like to fire them at the US military who has remained with these military bases in Iraq and Syria. Wait, I thought we got out of those countries. Oh yeah, they are letting the world know that the US never withdrew. Um, and that's what's going on. These are completely illegal military occupations of places we were supposed to have left years ago and we're getting shot at. And like people, asshole neocons online are like, how dare the Iranians shoot at our military bases? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, how dare they put all those Iranians around our military base? Uh, yeah, I love that meme on Twitter. The, the how dare Iran sit so close to all our military bases? <laughs> Exactly. All of them just surround. Yeah, we're begging for war. I mean, we have been since begging. 2001. I mean, we've been trying to start this. This is not a, yeah. a new thing. And now they're pushing Nikki Haley as hard as they possibly can because she'll go in there the day she's elected. If they, if that woman ever became president, we would probably just nuke the Middle East. Like there's horrifying things happening in the world right now. And like nuclear war is not a fantasy that, you know, Ronald Reagan dreamed up. This is a thing that could happen and, and kill millions of people. It's funny. I think of in the, the Palestine thing, there's the famous Dennis Prager video that if all the Palestinians would put down their guns, there'd be peace. It's like, yeah, no, if, if I honestly think if the world turned its back and let Israel do whatever it wants, just had a week, we'd turn around. There'd be no Gaza left. It would just oh, be yeah. a parking lot. They, they, oh, yeah. the only way they know to solve this problem is kill everyone. And they're, oh, yeah. Like they want to, they're, they're not, they're not really hiding the ball here. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the politics of Israel, because this is crucial to understand. And there is some, there's quite a bit of nuance here that I think it's missed even by sophisticates on this. So I think most people who have followed this conflict, at least are aware of the new government, which was elected in late fall and took office in January, the new Netanyahu coalition right. government, which is led by Likud, but it is this coalition, including all these super far right wing, often settler parties, some of which are led by Ben Gavir or this guy Smotrich, who are now cabinet ministers and high level cabinet ministers. And Ben Gavir is the security minister. So that means he runs security in the West Bank. <laughs> and this guy, these guys are openly racist. And I don't mean like they said, you know, they made a you know, some mean racial joke 10 years ago on Twitter. No, these are people who say like Palestinians are not a people and that land is ours, and we should expel every single person who's there and take it over forever. These are ethnic cleansing fascists. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Even most, in fact, I would say all of the pro-Israel people that I personally know hate those guys. They hate the current government. Now, so they are clearly fascist and would not mind turning all of Gaza into a parking lot. In fact, one of them said exactly that. We want to turn it into a parking lot. So that's what amazes me that people are not like acknowledging that that's what's going on currently. And they're sort of pretending that Israel is the Israel of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when there was a very large left wing, a very large peace movement. The Labor Party was the dominant party at the time for most of Israel's existence, run by Ashkenazi year European left-wing, usually socialist Zionist Jews who were secular too, and who wanted peace with the Palestinians. And they wanted to live in harmony with their neighbors and, and Arab neighbors, and at least ostensibly, that's what they said. Now, Max Blumenthal has made a really compelling argument that that was essentially a front that Zionists, even the most liberal and left among them, have always needed the expulsion of Palestinians to acquire their ultimate objective, which was the establishment of a Jewish homeland on all of the land of Israel. But anyway, there has been a change in their rhetoric, in their tone in the last 20 years. The Israeli political establishment has started to talk about, forget it, Palestinians can never have their own state. So they're against a two-state solution. They're against any kind of Palestinian state. And 
It's basically been a project of making their lives more and more hellish, promoting the settlers, the settlements into the West Bank. So now the West Bank has 600,000 Jewish settlers living inside of it. They have settlements that are the size of small cities all across the West Bank. These are every single one of these is completely illegal in occupied territory. It's a military occupation and they're building their own settlements in there so that Palestinians can never have a state. They're making it physically impossible. They call it making facts on the ground. It's illegal according to everybody in the world, but that's the government, the current government. So the question is, if you got rid of this current government and brought back those good old lefty, crunchy, left-winger governments of the past to at least talk to good game about loving their Palestinian brothers and sisters, would it be better? And I think the argument is no. Um, I think Max Blumenthal is correct on this. The Zionist project requires expulsion. It requires expulsion. And it has to happen. And if the people refuse to leave on their own, then it requires violence to expel them. Sometimes, many times, conquered people have left voluntarily, right? They've become refugees and they've left on their own, like in Syria. But the Palestinians are just this really unusual people, and it is a point of pride among them that they never resisted. Now, me, if you like stuck me in Palestine anytime in the last 50 or so years and said, okay, you're here now. I've been like, I would have just try to figure out a way to get out, I think, because that's my mind. I have a modern cosmopolitan rootless mind. But again, these people are from a totally different culture in which the land, there's a real connection to the land and real honor and honor connected to the land. Yeah, so, it's, it's horrifying. They, they they are a conquered people that are refusing to admit that they're conquered. They, they won't give up. They're going to fight until the last one of them. And Israel's saying, OK, like it's right. It's, it's a horrifying situation. Yeah. And so I, I used to sort of be, I suppose, nominally in favor of a two state solution, but I've been convinced by Rabbi Shapiro and basically the left generally on this. The left has changed its position. It used to be for a two state solution. And now the dominant position on the left is that a one state solution is the only real solution because a two state solution means an Israeli state right next to a Palestinian full on state, like right with actual sovereignty, meaning an actual state and an actual military right next to each other. Now, if nothing, and then who gets the good land? You know, after this deal is made, does the Palestinian state get the land that they want? Does it get the symbolic locations? Does it get Jerusalem, for instance? <laughs> does it get, I mean, shit, a lot of there, you know, there are people still punching IDF soldiers in the face over Yaffa, which is Tel Aviv, basically being taken in 1948. Like they're still mad about that, like deeply mad about that. They hold the keys to their original homes and their houses. It's a thing among Palestinians. They have these old keys that are from their homes in 1948. So yeah, a one state solution is the only solution, dude. So just go do it. No, I mean, of course, that's like, what, a century, maybe two centuries. I mean, who knows how long that's going to take, but you can't have this permanent ethnic racial division. You can't, you can't, apartheid has been shown to be unsustainable. It was shown in the United States. It was shown in South Africa and it's being certainly being it's obvious in Israel. It doesn't work. It's a form of daily violence and people react to it and resist it. And they do so in ways that are not always nice. And if you want to live with people who are always resisting you in that way, you have the state of Israel and everybody has to be in the army. And there's an Israeli personality that is especially belligerent that everyone knows that is not an accident. It's being a part of a militarized society by necessity. It's not because they are inherently evil or inherently militaristic. No, they made this choice to live in this fucking place, this Jewish ethno state, again, in an ocean of Arabs, and to not allow people who they expelled to come back. And you can't be a, you can't be a citizen unless you're Jewish. So it's just not gonna, it's, it's unsustainable. It is unsustainable. It's just a question of how many years of violence do you want to have? And if you've paid attention at all to this issue, you know that it's basically every one or two years. We have to deal with this. This is just the worst one, but since 1973, but you know, it's always bombings and killings of hundreds and sometimes thousands of Palestinians and like five or 10 or 20 Israelis. In this case, it's more than ever, but usually it's just, yeah. it's just a cycle of violence. No doubt about it. But the question is the origin of that cycle of violence. Who is ultimately responsible for it? And the answer is only one thing. It's not people. It's an idea. It's Zionism. It's the idea of a Jewish exclusive ethnostate in Palestine that will never work. So, but then again, you got this country with what is it, 10 plus million people in it who are now like third, fourth, fifth generation Israelis and yeah. they have no place to go to. They're not from Europe anymore. They used to be from Europe and they're not anymore. They're from there now. Now, what the fuck do you do? I mean, I, I think the Israeli state's going to exist. That's why I, I don't say I'm anti-Zionist because Israel's there. It's not going anywhere. It would be yeah. it would be a worse genocide if they did go somewhere, right? Like if all but the- it doesn't have to be, Sure, but it doesn't have to be a Jewish state. Yeah, I- That's the problem. That's the problem. Yes. Not Israel. It's that it's a Jewish state.
Yeah, it's uh, my parents have some friends that live in Bethlehem, actually. Uh, they're Christian and they feel like second class citizens. Like it is a Jewish state. You do not have full rights. And I mean, I know the Israelis always say like, well, the Muslims are more free here, like the ones that we actually let out of the <laughs> concentration camps. They're more free here than than most states around us. It's like, yeah, but you're scoring on a curve there. Like you're, you're still not as free as your citizens. It's just this like head game they play. It's like, yeah, well, we give more freedoms. Well, they're they're talking about they're talking about Arab. They're called like Arab forty eight Arabs. The the Arabs who stayed in Israel. Yeah. They're talking about those Arabs, right? The Arabs, the Arabs living in the West Bank and Gaza right. ain't more ain't more free than Arabs no. elsewhere. No, those are the least free people on earth, arguably. I yeah, I don't understand how do people like the the Ben Shapiro's of the world say it's not a concentration camp. I, I don't like I don't even understand the argument that because, because Gaza the, had an because election, it has shopping malls, Henry. Yeah, oh, the shopping it's malls. That's right. Of, I swear to God, that's what they say. It has shopping malls and people go on vacation occasionally. They are allowed to leave sometimes. You have to apply to the Israeli government or the Egyptian government, and one of them has to let you out. And they only let you out when they want to let you out. Right. And Israel apparently rarely lets people out, and Egypt is more lenient. And so people do occasionally get visas from Egypt, and they use those visas to take vacations in Egypt or in Turkey, and they come back after a week or two. But it's but it's like, I mean, for an American, especially like a right winger who's all about liberty and freedom right. and property property rights and like and the yeah. ability to trade, do commerce, <laughs> to like be defending the regime in Gaza. Like I've had friends, man, I've had libertarian friends say to me that, that, that they should continue the blockade because uh, of because it's too dangerous. I'm like, OK, well, I, I don't. Um, I, the, the, and the fact that they what drop a. a flat bomb on top of your house before they level your entire house is supposed to be some kind of like, dude, if somebody warned me to get out of my house before bombing it, I would not be not mad that they bombed my house. Like, I don't understand the argument here. It's just because they, they give didn't... you a whole they give you a whole 30 minutes, Henry. What the <laughs> fuck, man? That's a moral army. I know. Can you imagine that? We're supposed to be like, oh, they give them 30 minutes warning before they destroy their entire house with their whole family in it. OK, cool. And you know what else? About Palestinian society, again, it's a very traditional society in which generations in each family stay and live together very commonly. So what you'll have in Gaza, apparently, you'll have um, houses or basically small apartment buildings in which each floor is occupied by a different generation of the family. So you'll have like four or five generations of a family in the same building, which right. gets leveled. Boom. That's why you get these stories of in entire families getting wiped out 20 30 40 people from grandchildren to great grandchildren grand grandparents getting killed at once but yeah they knocked on the roof before they dropped the bomb so it's i just don't it's understand cool. so it's cool the arguments just don't make sense but people are so committed to them why are like why are people is it it's just the idea of zionism they just it's really a religious belief right is i can't imagine any other logical reason like it doesn't well, <clears throat> so there's so there's Jewish kids who went through the mainstream Jewish experience, American Jewish American experience of summer camps, often with a Zionist tinge or outright Zionist summer camps. They were off. They're offered birthright trips by Israel. You know, my son's still considering doing it. I think when they start when they're 18, I think they can go and all expenses paid. And apparently it's like a fuck fest. And I've heard stories. I've had friends who've done it and they come back with like sex stories always there. And no, really, like I think they encourage that in various ways, sex on those trips for sort of obvious reasons. Right. But it, yeah. And so and you just hear the the if you're in, from sort of a mainstream, I mean, the Jewish families I was a part of and that I've known were never, never cared about Israel at all. Like it was never even mentioned. But many, many Amer Jewish American families sort of have this as an ideology in their families and they carry it forward and they give their kids to it. And, and they just don't see, they literally don't learn about what's happened to the Palestinians and they don't learn, they learn a very selective history and they, yeah. they know about a little bit of Hasbara, which is Israeli propaganda. But um, so that I understand why Jewish Americans do that. And of course they always think about the Holocaust first. It's sure. like, Oh my God, they tried to kill all of us and we can't have our own state now to defend ourselves. I mean, on the most primitive basic level, I see why that works. And that's, that's Israel has been running on that since 1948 well I mean, and that, if you if you go back through the pogroms and all that stuff like there were jews were not treated well throughout history like i understand the yeah. instinct oh yeah no totally no and again if they hadn't displaced people it would have been totally cool like right. no problem that's why moving to rural argentina would have been a much better idea right. but no they got it in their heads the zionists they don't know it has to be this symbolic biblical thing even though they were all secular jews oh no we got to move back to our original homeland you know according to the bible <laughs> all the symbolic power they also thought about uganda which would have been another great idea 
a sparsely inhabited, probably wouldn't need to displace many people. But no, they had to go uproot half a million Arabs. Oh, I ended up being like a million Arabs by the time they did Israel. But so that's why Jews have these feelings. I get that. And when you're a Jewish American, you're sort of raised to have very, very deep feelings about the Holocaust for sort of understandable reasons. Yeah. And it's like a, you may have noticed that it's like every Jew, you know, says they have some Holocaust survivor in their family, which I'm sure is at least partly bullshit. But anyway, so I, I kind of I get it. Um, now, the question I have had recently, and this is what's been most disturbing, is people who are Gentiles, who have no other connection to Israel, nor are they evangelical oh. Christians. I knew why the evangelicals like it. They're just sort of like, you know, free floating public intellectual types who have chosen Israel in this. And I think it is because they're bourgeois and they don't like what they perceive to be Arab culture, brown people culture, third world culture. And Israel looks like this groovy, cool, high tech Silicon Valley. Chicks are hot. They speak our language. They, you know, have great restaurants. It's they're us. I just yeah. think it's that kind of cultural identification. And the Palestinians are weird and ancient and foreign and the women wear headscarves and they look different and Allah Akbar and what? And, you know, it's just all martyrs. How disgusting that they have a culture of martyrs. How could that happen? How could Palestinians have a culture in which people who die for the cause are celebrated? I can't imagine how they would have invented a culture that makes them feel better about dying all the time. It's just so amazing that, you know, I grew up through college where I had all my Jewish friends would, I was just pro-Israel because I was, because I was surrounded by it. And then I started seeing the videos of the soldiers. This is before, way before October 7th. They just gut shoot these kids walking up to the fence, like, and laugh about it. There's a lot of videos of Israeli soldiers being horrible to Palestinians, literally murdering them, shooting off legs. The Great March of Return was 2018 and 2019. It went on for a year. This was the last time they tried a major nonviolent protest in Gaza. So this was mm -hmm. damn near the entire population, like hundreds of thousands of people would march to the fence without guns and hold up signs and chant and protest to say, tear down this fence, let us be free, give us rights, end the siege, let us trade, let us leave, let us, you know, give us basic human rights. That's incredible. This is going on in 2023. And there are friends of mine who are arguing for it. But anyway, so yeah, they would do this. And the IDF had snipers all along the fence and the wall there. And the order was to shoot them below the waist, to disable them, not kill them. And so now you have, I think the number is in the thousands. You have thousands of mostly young men missing a leg in Gaza. So you see lots and lots. Apparently when you go there, you'll see lots and lots of guys and some women too with crutches or not, or just not walking and just with one leg. Yeah. Some women were shot in the crotch. There was one woman, I think it was shot in the vagina. And of course, some people were shot above the waist and too. So, I mean, there are dozens yeah. of those. Yeah. So, you know, why, why don't they, why don't they have a Martin Luther King? Why don't they have a Gandhi? Why don't they be nonviolent? Why don't they protest for their rights? Well, that's what happened. Not even that long ago when they did just that. It's gross. I mean, the whole thing is just gross. Israelis move to New York City. You'll be a lot safer. You'll be surrounded by your people. And that's what I think should be done. If I were president or in the Congress, if I were in Congress, I would introduce legislation to transform the spending on Israel, which is four billion dollars a year into a fund to help resettle any Israeli citizen to move anywhere else in the world. We have huge tracts of land in this country. We have, you know, the Indian reservations. We could we could build the Israeli looks, reservation. Looks a lot like Israel, by the way, yeah. the topography of the West, Western. Oh, California looks just like Israel. <clears throat> so, yeah, no, seriously. I mean, and we owe it to them. I do think that especially the younger generations, kids who have been born there since 1948, it's not their fault at all. Yeah. But we created that thing. The United States of America, with our tax money, they they created is the state of Israel as it is today. And so I think we absolutely are obligated to help them leave. It's just, of course, they need to want to leave and that's not going to happen anytime yeah. soon. Although it might, my friend who lives in Israel, he's lived there almost his entire adult life, grew up in California, <laughs> decided to become an Israeli. But during the second intifada in the in 2000s, he said that he was convinced that there would be a nuclear bomb exploded in an Israeli city in his lifetime. It's not the craziest prediction. I don't know. Well, there was a video three or four weeks ago from Gaza of a group of people in Gaza like it was a couple of men and these boys. And the, one of the men was saying that he was pointing to the one of the boys. He was like a seven-year-old boy. And he was saying his parents were just shot to by the IDF. 
And you know what this boy is going to do when he grows up? He's going to invent a nuclear bomb and he's going to explode it in the Zionist cities. And I'm like, could be, could be. It's what I'd want to do. It's what I'd want to do if I were them. Well, on that happy note, we've been going, <laughs> I actually don't know how long we've, we've been on the phone for two and a half hours, but I don't know when we hit record. Yeah, man. But there's so much stuff I didn't even get to. I, I wanted to kind of, there was a parallel I wanted to draw between the National Industrial Recovery Act and kind of the COVID policies. Because I think that's really, okay. there's some interesting stuff there. But Whoa. instead of that, I will recommend that people go join Unregistered Academy Academy and watch your World War II series. That was like the coolest lessons you've ever done. It's a what three part series or four part series? Uh, three, I think. Three, I think yeah. yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's freaking awesome. Uh, and then your history of slavery. You have a lot of really good uh, stuff behind the the Unregistered Academy paywall there. So I highly yeah. endorse people going to sign up. It's it's not that expensive, and you get to hang out with. Uh, that on what Thursday nights, if you want every Thursday. Yep. After the live and chat in, and in the classes too, we do, we always talk and have a Q and a. That's how I know you. Yeah. Uh, we've had lots of conversations. Yeah. It's great. So that, and then if he ever does another live event, I recommend those. Those are the Chicago tour was really fun. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. Well, well, Icarus Fest, we haven't announced it yet, but save the date. We just got a huge speaker. Um, by the, I can't say who it is, but just trust me. It's a, it's a very I, major person in our world. Two of them, actually. Uh, that's going to be June 7th and 8th in New Jersey, in Rutherford, New Jersey. It's our second Icarus Festival. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. So. I, uh, I only missed the first one because my grandmother turned a hundred that weekend. So I had to, had yeah. to go to that party because apparently that's a milestone. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you who we got when we turn off the recording. Yeah. But it's pretty cool. So it's going to be big. And again, go, go by the yeah, book. man. Renegade history of the United States. The best, my favorite history book of all time. Whoa. Damn. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Henry. All right, That's everybody. Awesome. Stay free.